inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. If you are brand new to rental property investing and you're trying to figure out how to get started, I wrote an ebook that'll walk you through the five steps to buy your first rental property. You can download it right now. Just go to landlordgift.com. My guest on the podcast today considers himself to be a combination of Robert Kiyosaki and Dave Ramsey. If you don't know what that means, Robert Kiyosaki loves debt. He wants to take on as much debt as he can. And Dave Ramsey hates debt and wants nothing to do with it. So my guest understands that you need debt to buy rentals, but he wants to get rid of that debt as quickly as he can. So we're going to talk to him about how he's doing that. We're also going to talk to him about how he was able to leave his job and support himself off rental income. And we're also going to get into Section 8. He 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 owns a lot of Section 8 properties, so we're going to talk to him uh, kind of about the ins and outs and why he likes Section 8 and see if he can give us some tips on it. So let's take a real quick break. We'll come back in a minute and we'll meet Andrew Fiddler from Toledo. The first step in buying a rental property is to get pre-qualified. And I would suggest you work with a lender that specializes in working with investors because you don't want to get to closing and find out the money's not there and you can't close. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's got a special offer just for our listeners. She's offering to waive all the pre-qualification fees if you mention Rental Income Podcast. Find out more today. Contact Chaley at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com. Would you like to know the easiest way to create wealth and passive income with real estate? This is Marco Santarelli with Norada Real Estate Investments. Now you can access the best deals without the stress or hassle of having to find, renovate, or manage those properties. We save you time by providing you with passive income investment properties in some of the best U.S. markets. Learn more by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing. There's no obligation and nothing to buy. Simply visit PassiveRealEstateGuide.com and get your free copy today. That's PassiveRealEstateGuide.com. Hey, Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Why don't we start with you telling us where you're at today, and then we'll kind of take a step back and figure out how you got there. I personally have less than 50 properties as of today. Uh, the, the market continues to rise and I've got a pretty steady stream of you know, folks that'll reach out, want to invest in Toledo, Ohio. And, you know, with the market where it stands and continuing to grow, uh, very commonly when they're looking for uh, a niche and a, an investment vehicle, I will have owned one of those for you know a period of five years. The tenants have been in place for years, and I have zero issue valuing them at you know the current market rate. So the if anything, my portfolio kind of ebbs and flows, but I try and keep it right around fifty. There was a there was a discussion with my wife a while back that you know, do you really need 200? And the answer is absolutely not. I, I do enjoy tackling challenges. I like nothing more than a tenant who, you know, wants to see me in court or the property that needs a full rehab. Um, I, I don't want to get my set of 50 operating and then stop working. Like that's mm-hmm. not my goal. My goal is to wake up. Uh, I keep a home office here where we run our properties out of. And so I like to cross my driveway head up to our office and and tackle challenges all day. That's what I enjoy. So you've got a lot going on today. You've got the rentals, you've got your real estate business, but would you say that if the real estate business went away, you could support yourself off the rental income? And I would say that is the daily requirement for me as a father and as a husband is we know that markets ebb and flow. And Mm -hmm. we know that there will be a recession. We just don't know when. Right. Uh, You know, my my portfolio was built on the bones of investors who over leveraged. The tide went out. They were swimming naked, to quote the uh, the uh, Warren Buffett quote. And and they they ended up folding and and, leaving markets. And my interest is to ensure that I am incredibly solid in you know, my investment categories. Now, yeah. one thing you you said before the show is that you, you kind of have a combination of Dave Ramsey and Robert Kiyosaki in, in you with, with your investing philosophy. Well, what do you mean by that? 
and I would I would use the uh, the uh, the rubber band uh, analogy. I, I acknowledge that you have to take on debt to grow aggressively. And when I I won't even say left my day job when the day job was yanked from me in 2009 and you're standing in the cold realizing that the economy is no longer working. I'm no longer providing a service to the marketplace and getting a salary from the marketplace and able to buy products from the marketplace to repeat the entire cycle. When we had a breakdown in the recession, my my wife was crying, worried about losing our home. My son was three months old. We leveraged every dime we could. Uh, the you know the translation on that is that we left a a you know a, a a lot of debt and we wanted to solidify that as time goes on and that would roll us into that Dave Ramsey the 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 concept of of you know paying cash of getting rid of your debt and being rock solid um, I would refer to Dave Ramsey's personal tragedy was when he had large multi-million dollar loans on on himself and when those loans were called he went bankrupt and so i'm just very cognizant that as long as the market is happy everybody can get loans it's no big deal but if that if that economy changes especially with me now where i don't have an official day job i have uh, you know, commissions. I have a property management company. I have real estate uh, uh, rental income. But if banks decide they want to tighten their standards and they want to start calling loans, you need to let that rubber band contract pay right. pay down some of that. And that would be the the Dave Ramsey effect on that concept. So, how do you do that specifically? Like, do you take extra money every month and attack one of the mortgages, or do you just try to pay them all down over time? Well, the, and and my my specific capabilities within the market has been a line of credit. So I buy my properties for cash, which gets me the best value, and you know, quick close, very efficient. Uh, and so the other advantage is then I'm always just paying down on one line of okay. credit. Okay, okay, that's yep. awesome. Okay, so so you you have the line of credit, you buy a property, maybe even buy a second property with that line of credit, and then you just over time, you, you, you work on paying that down and getting that paid off. Exactly. And, and the, the, the good thing is, and I, I, I recommend this to every investor who's getting started, is keep the day job because banks drool over financing with a salary. Mm-hmm. And so the, what's interesting is when you have one property and a mortgage or a line of credit, whatever that would be, a debt, then it's really a slow process. You, you, you get very depressed. When you have 10 properties, five of which are all cash free, you know, debt free, those 10 properties paying on a line of credit is a very magical effect. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you essentially hit a point where you're like, well, every six months I can buy a property and then you speed that up. Now, every three months I can buy a property. Right. Yeah, it, it really is pretty magical when that snowball starts kicking in. Now, let, let's go back a couple of steps to, to kind of understand how you got started, because um, yeah. you, you've really accomplished a lot in in the last, uh, how long has it been? Like 10 years? Yeah, yeah well, a little uh, less than 10 years. 2009, so in, we began. So th- take me back to 2009. Um, tell me what, what you were doing back then and how you first got started. Sure. So I was a salaried project manager. I was a contractor to an automotive parts supplier and I attended a Robert Kiyosaki, it was a, yep, Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, uh, free seminar up in Detroit, Michigan. We, we drove up, uh, buddy and I sat through the seminar. Um, I walked away agreeing that there was some real potential for income in real estate, but I verbatim told my buddy that I was making too much money to plunge a toilet. And thus I tempted fate. And within six months, the recession ended up with the automotive manufacturers, Chrysler, GM declaring bankruptcy, part suppliers cutting everything they possibly could, their own staff. So you can imagine contractors were, were not even a forethought. They, they dumped us out of the side and we were, we were out of the labor pool immediately. And so I started uh, April of 2009, you know, with, with no, no revenue coming in, uh, no capability of, you know, a, a salary. And then you throw your, your job up on monster.com 
and or your you know your your app your uh, your resume and everybody up there in this area had automotive experience some basic middle management capabilities and nobody was hiring you mm-hmm. know companies weren't interested in in growing and expanding they're just trying to survive and retain their core talent um, and so that's that's what we pulled every bit of debt we could and I spent I, I did I did part time work underemployed to be able to keep bills paid. And then I also ended up with, uh, uh, you know, working on properties nonstop. I, I would say there was an easy 90 days where it was just seven days a week, 12 hours a day. If I wasn't working, I was in Toledo, hands on renovating, collecting rent, managing the tenants. I was doing everything at that point because there was no capability to to change that. You mentioned at the very beginning of the interview that you have 50 rentals today in your portfolio. And over time, you have added properties and you've sold properties. Part of your portfolio was multifamily properties where you, you owned some apartment complexes and you have sold all those off and your properties today are single family houses. Why do you think single families are a better investment than multifamily apartments? And, and that really would stem from a, a, a two-sided evaluation. When you buy an apartment complex and you want to sell that apartment complex, you are going to sell to another investor, someone who is a shark in the market and wants the lowest price possible. When we're buying homes, first of all, your homes are available in a wide, you know, range. You can get them from the MLS. You can get them from investors who have done an eviction, aren't paying their taxes. You can get them from you know families when uh, grandma's got to move into the nursing home and we've got to dispose of grandma's house. There's, there's a, a wide range of, of ways to acquire single family. And then when you sell those single family, your ultimate goal is either, you know, from a turnkey standpoint, you want it rented and operating and then an investor is willing to pay a a good price for that. And then the other one, which is the shooting the moon, if you perform the updates, which would be a different category from a day to day rental. I I always like to say you want to you want a durable bomb proof rental for for a rental product. But when that house is ready to be sold and you want to upgrade some key items in it, you're going to be able to command a premium for that on the market. And I, I, from that standpoint, I'm very you know, interested and excited in the, in the single family. Uh, when, when you look at your tenant class, like your one bedroom apartment would be the antithesis of a, a house. Uh, your one bedroom apartment is going to be you know, some, a, a young person, an old person, maybe a single parent, but they they're in a transitional phase. You know, retiree is going to stay in your in your one bedroom apartment for for the you know the most durable length of time. But other than that, they're a transient uh, interaction with that property. As soon as they're they're uh, as soon as they develop their economic position, they're going to move up. As opposed to a three bedroom house where you can always throw another child into that mix. You know, you can you can always kind of reorient. And then when you're ready to move from a three bedroom to a four, three bedroom to a five, if we have the relationship you've been paying on time, you know, you've got a section eight voucher, you're a manageable personality and appreciate what we do for you. And we appreciate what you do for us. Then I have zero issue acknowledging that for the next 90 days, I personally will identify, you know, a house that meets what you're looking for, buy it and rehab it and get you moved in on the thing. So you think that or you found that with single family homes, you're getting a better quality tenant and someone that is going to end up being more profitable for you. Absolutely. And and I would qualify that Section 8 has been a very durable method of, of investment for uh, for the single families. And, and I, I want to say we're right around 50 percent um, when we offer up a property for rent, uh, especially in any of my lower end neighborhoods. You know, Section eight is the premier product to be able to place those, you know, to be able to place those properties into to perform well. Uh, your Section eight tenants are very stable. They're, they, they've got they've got the system organized. You know, our responsibility is to ensure that it meets the, the HUD standards for housing. And we ensure that the tenant is is caring for the property. If they've got a portion they pay, ensure they're paying that. 
The tenant's responsibility is to ensure that they're they're providing their documentation to the government, that they're, they prove their eligibility and that they're caring for the property. Government's responsibility is to ensure that the tenant in the property qualifies and is keeping their, their paperwork clean and clear. And then at the same time, ensuring that the habitability standards are met. And, and with that, with that, you know, that three-way interaction in mind, I still have my original Section 8 tenant eight years later in a rental rental house. Yeah, you know, um, Section 8 is, is kind of funny because anyone that I've talked to that does Section 8 loves it. You know, they, they think it's the greatest thing ever. But anyone that hasn't done Section 8 is afraid of it. Um, do you think there's anything that people should be afraid of with Section 8? Well, what you have to acknowledge with Section 8, so my my team in Toledo, we we have two Section 8 inspections that are happening today, in fact. Um, when the inspector walks through the property, they're God. Mm-hmm. What if, they, if they're agitated by what they see on the side of a house from, a, from you know, 20 feet in the air, then by God, we're putting an extension ladder on that property right now to address it. Right. Um, it's, it's not the relationship to, to, you know, chest bump and argue. Uh, once you've kind of explained that authority to your team on the ground, then it's a it's a very it's very you know lucrative, and and then the other one would be delays. One of the things that I'm I, I is my biggest headache is when I help an investor buy their first investment, buy any investment, and then you're going to sign a voucher on a Section Eight tenant. Um, so to begin that process, you advertise. Are on a, a unit's availability, and you say, "Hey, we've got a home, and you, you, you know, bring me your voucher, or or come in and sign out an application if you're a standard tenant." When you accept a standard tenant, that tenant is going to bring you rent and deposit and move in. Very smooth, very simple. When you move into the Section Eight, you have three pages of paperwork to fill out, and then that paperwork gets signed and handed into the office. And you can go anywhere from two days to three weeks before you have a response from them. And if the response is you missed a blank or the information is wrong on the blank, they hand the paperwork back to you. You complete it again. You hand it back in and you start that clock over. Mm. Then you're going to go for inspection. Then the tenant will be allowed to move in. And then you will begin accruing money. And if you pass inspection, what today is the 20th or something, 19th, 20th, we will get our rent money on the first of the month. And then if we were to, to pass one on the 27th of the month, we wouldn't get that money until the first month of the following month, but we would get the pro rate for this existing month. So section eight is very lucrative. It's a very durable investment. However, it is a pain in the tail to get started and organized. That would be one of the reasons why when I've got folks that are looking for, hey, I want a house and I want it to be a section eight rental. Well, I've got 30. I can give you one. It will cash flow tomorrow, but I don't have to go through the hoops of what do you mean it's been seven days and the office hasn't written back? Well, why? Well, I, they're a government office. I can't make them go faster. They're they're just going to have their ongoing you know process of of getting things passed. Sometimes they're faster, sometimes they're slower. But the, you know, interacting with the government agency is one of the detractions from the Section Eight process. Uh, um, Andrew, if someone wants to to reach out to you, maybe if someone's interested in investing in Toledo, uh, you would be a, a really great resource for them. W- what's the best way for someone to reach out to you? You can go to our website, Laplant L A P L A N T E, and that's got a BS dot com. On the on the end, but uh, we're Laplant, and the other option is to uh, just head over to Stonehenge Realty, and we're we're linked through uh, through them as well. Um, you know, the from from that end of it, uh, I, there is nothing I enjoy more than chatting with investors to see you know what their interest is and their goals are, and you know what we can do to to make those happen. And and you know, very commonly, damage control. If you have an investment in Toledo and and you were led astray, you made some poor choices. Let's talk about you know what what the options are. Um, I would say it it it's, it's always a toss up. Uh, I have had some buildings that are going to require massive work that are not in my area to efficiently renovate and operate, and we'll sell those as realtor. We'll get them get them off the market. Uh, but my, my ultimate goal is that you stay in the Toledo market. To me, it's a failure for our community if you sell out of Toledo 
leave with a bad taste in your mouth and then, you know, invest in Florida. Uh, my goal is to help you reallocate into performing assets and, and operate from there. Yeah, it's all about having that that right manager. So if, if you have a bad manager in Toledo, Andrew is definitely your guy. Re- definitely reach out to him. If you miss his contact information, I'll go ahead and put it on the website. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 183. Thank you so much for listening and subscribing to the podcast. We'll have a new interview for you next Tuesday. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.